we're here for the squid or the visitors or invaders is kind of the catchphrase. And we're looking at uh, the Magister squid and the Boreal Pacific squid. A lot of you pulled me aside already and said, look what I've tripped for, I've found them. Uh, they are here now. And so we're, we're, we're talking about that, we're looking at the, who they are and what they're doing here and what does that mean for, for Peter's Berg and, and the inside waters and stuff. But before we get into the exciting things, I am uh, working with the University of Alaska in Fairbanks on my PhD. I'm um, working in association with the University of Tokyo in Japan to work on migratory patterns of squid from Japan to the Aleutians and looking at their life cycles throughout those waters. Um, that's not what we're talking about tonight, it's a little far from home. <laughs> but, uh, and when I did my master's, that was at UW, University of Washington, and I did that um, with the uh, um, science of aquatic and fishery studies, looking at gooey ducks of uh, mollusks related to a squid. <laughs> Um, but that's the that's the boring stuff. So we'll get into the really the really exciting things that you guys are here. But before I get into that, a lot of people ask me why do I look at squid? Why are you passionate about squid and octopus? So I'm going to kind of start with a little bit of a I'm going to shorten the story to kind of understand what these uh, creatures are capable of. A lot of people um, understand that squid and octopus have a very high reception and logical ability, but they don't really realize how much it is. And so when I was working at the University of Washington, I went up to Bellingham to uh, help redesign their octopus tank to make it escape free, um, which didn't work, by the way. <laughs> so we got a call about five in the morning from animal control to let us know that the octopus was outside of our um, marine science center. And we both were like, this is a prank. They were going to get there and there's going to be graffiti or something. So we get there at 5 in the morning, and lo and behold, there's an octopus sitting outside on the ground, outside the door of the Marine Science Center. And so this is what had happened. <laughs> we had redone the tank. There was a nice lid on it. It's locked. We redid the filtration system, so you, you, you know, had to unscrew them and everything. And it could, the octopus couldn't get out the intake valve, apparently. It's right on the pier, but it could get it out the outtake valve. It tore apart the filter, made a one-way door for itself. We discovered that very expensive filter was now broken. And it got out, and it got into the bay, but the being homebodies, octopus specifically, not squid, it wanted to come back, it couldn't come back that one-way door, so it decided to crawl across the pier. This is in a you know, kind of blurry security camera, around four in the morning, the light starts coming up, and we see this blob, and the security footage, cross the pier, go to the door and wait. About 20 minutes later, they have to go back in the water, goes back in the water, comes back. It does this for a couple seconds before this poor jogger runs along there, and he does, does a dead stop and drops his phone. He picks up, calls 911, and they in turn call animal control, we get there. And, and they say, there's an octopus, and indeed there's an octopus on that door. And we open it, and the octopus, without hesitation, this is what really got me, it not only did it not hesitate when we opened that door, it did make eye contact. So it made eye contact and held that eye contact while it crossed a room about the size of this library to its tank and waited and it would not climb up the tank until we unlocked the lid. And then it proceeded to climb to its tank. So at that point I knew, I already love marine biology, but it's at that point when I went, wait a second, there's something we're underestimating here. And maybe that's not just octopus, maybe that's squid too. Squid are a grouping animal, so they have different behaviors in an individual. But what's to say they couldn't be in that same situation and as a group be able to communicate and figure that out? So that's what really drove me to say, what's the story behind squid? So uh, we'll talk today about the arm hook squid. They're the most prolific um, species of fam the family of squid in Alaska. There are 13 different species in Alaska. Um, 10 of which reside in the Gulf, and none previously, till you guys started discovering them, had resided in inside waters, meaning Chatham, Frederick Sound, Wrangell, Petersburg, Juneau, Ketchikan. And so all of a sudden, these two species started appearing specifically, as you guys have been showing your pictures of, the um, Magister, which you see on the left, and then the Boreal Pacific, which you see on the right. I haven't seen any pictures from this group, that's mostly up in Juneau that we've been seeing those. But the big difference between the two is that the uh, Magister squid, if you look at it, it has a nice red color, it does scar white, but it has a, two clubs on the ends of its tentacles. Most of those squid, they have eight arms and two tentacles, as most of you probably know, but they have clubs on the end. And that's the big difference between the two of them here. The one on the right is just a kind of sterile picture, so you can't tell it actually does get as red as the Magister squid, um, just not so much in that picture. 
So they both are known previously to be open pelagic deep living squid, anywhere from about 100 to 1,000 meters. And that's where they spend their life out in the Bering, out in the Gulfs, not in inside waters. And so all of a sudden, we, our previous map kind of got a little bit off kilter, starting in about 2009, when they started showing up in Sitka. And we went, wait a second, what's going on? And so that's where it leads me into um, the distribution map of starting with the Magister squid. So like I said, they live in, where you can see the light blue is the previous known areas that they live. They live for about four years. They spend their entire life out at sea. They spawn once and they die. And so they, they eat primarily zooplankton base, but that's what we had thought previously. <laughs> and the darker blue uh, overlap is in the early 2000s. They had only assumed that around the continental shelf was where these, these squid were primarily living. And they did some acoustical studies for, uh, to see which type of armbook squid are following the zooplankton in spring out in the open ocean. And they found, wait a second, these are magister squid. They're not supposed to be here. And there's not one or two, but all of our acoustical studies, seven uh, acoustical points, were actually showing these squid. And it suddenly went from, they don't live here, to maybe we don't understand the squid as we thought we had it in the past. And that was actually the primary squid that were there. And then, to blow our, all our theories out of the water, <laughs> Um, in 2009, in a trawling survey, they found that they were actually off of Sitka. They had forgotten some bycatch reports that were unsubstantiated. So, oh, this is what we found, and the biologists went, no, no, wait, those are out in the open ocean. And then, lo and behold, they were actually found off Sitka. And then, up in the a little bit, but primarily off of uh, coastal waters in that Sitka area in South China. And then, we started getting reports that I've been working with. Um, there are some of you who know we've seen them in 2012. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of those data points. The data points I've been given, um, primarily from the University of Alaska and NOAA, they indicate that around 2014 is when those they squid really started moving into Juneau and into Petersburg Wrangell area and both sides of Admiralty actually. And mostly from student reports, from fishermen reports, from people going out and cheating and spinning, go look what I found. <laughs> Posting on Facebook, and then wow, well, lo and behold, we found that information. And so, those that, those started to indicate, wait a second, they're no longer in the open ocean like we thought. They're actually moving slowly but surely. They're moving into inside waters, and they've been here since 2012, as you have been telling me. But the data points I was working with 2014, and really peaking 2014 to 2016, and even this year, you know, you can still find them. So it appears that so far these magister squid, they're here to stay. And when you look at the Boreal Pacific, it follows a similar pattern. There's not as much known about the Boreal Pacific, unfortunately, as a very similar, it's another armbook squid, very similar to the Magister, like I said, but it's just more open ocean, it lives deeper, uh, doesn't come up as high, maybe about 300 meters, and it's been being found in Chatham as well. So we see that in 2011, um, um, at, up in a little north and near Kodiak and Cordova in those areas, but also, again, they found it off of Sitka, and they went, wait a second, here's a deep water squid that is found, and at minimum has been found previously at 300 meters, is now coming up at about 100 meters. That's a big difference there when you're looking at what you thought you knew. So then again, we, get, we start to get into the unverified reports that I've been kind of reading through to see where are they now. And Lo and behold, they started coming up in Chatham and both sides of Admiralty. I don't have any report, and in June, I don't have any reports really from Peterburg Wrangell area for the Boreal Pacific. Who knows why that is? Maybe we just haven't found it, or everyone just thinks it's the Magister. So, the biggest questions that we have from this map, right, is when you're, a lot of you are familiar with the scientific process, a lot of you probably know it better than I do. And if, when you come up with a problem like this where we thought we knew these things, now we don't. Now we're here, well, well so what? Why are they here and who cares? And a lot of questions get asked, like, can we eat them? Uh, yes, you can eat them. They're very tasty. Uh, but mostly, we are looking at why and what that means and, and all that. And so when I'm starting to look at this, I'm going to go, OK, what are the possible theories? So of course, the first one you always have to rule out or at least look at and acknowledge is maybe they were here all along. And for whatever reason, we didn't know it. 
right? Now based on higher sample rates, community knowledge, community involvement, we now have a bigger sample base so we can say, oh, they're here. That's always a possibility. It could also be cyclical, right? It could be uh, every four years, they just kind of show up and for a few years and then they disappear. We hadn't shown up before. It could be El Nino related, we don't know. Um, but it's, that could be migratory or life cycle towards the end of their life. They, you know, they spawn and die. Maybe they come in here right before they spawn and go back to out of the water waters. But the two that I've been really working on substantiating are the change in predator-prey relationship and the oceanic changes. So those two are pretty inter interrelated. So looking at what are they eating, is their prey changing? Uh, what we find in their stomachs, is that been changing based on where they are? And if it is changing, are they targeting different food for a certain reason, or are they following food into somewhere? So I'm going to focus on the prey changes for today. Those other ones are equally big. <laughs> Uh, in terms of possibilities, right? A lot of what we know about arm hook squids are nothing. So it is, it is pretty much, oh, we didn't know this before, and what we, the data we have is very little to work with. So based on that, what we look at is their diet. That's really a good indicator of a lot of where they're living, what they're eating, that kind of thing, and their life cycle as a whole. So when you look at um, their diet and their seasonal movements, like that first map I showed you had that dark blue section for the uh, magister squid. It showed they moved over here for the zooplankton. When they were in the zooplankton areas and they took samples, 60% of their diet was the zooplankton and a lot of other copepods and other small big ocean animals. And they said, okay, that, that makes sense. They're out here, they're eating the zooplankton, they're following a spring bloom. However, when they were off of sick, they started finding them on sick, they said, well, there's not a big zooplankton bloom here. So what are they eating? They have to be eating something. And they found that it's actually, it changes drastically. The zooplankton still makes a good quantity of it. However, if you notice, there's sablefish, black on herring, salmon, and how that are added to their diets. And not a small percentage either, but 20% total of their diet suddenly shifts from small creatures to larger creatures like the herring and the halibut. And so all of a sudden they showed up in spring in Sitka, lo and behold, a lot of us know what happens in spring in Sitka, the herring are there. And their diet is suddenly consuming 10% herring. Where that, when they're out in the open ocean, that wasn't there. Why did they suddenly start targeting this herring when we presumably didn't have that happen before? We don't know. But we know that when they're offshore, uh, or excuse me, when they're in the coastal areas, their diet is different. And so, what that indicates is, and that's happened in other squid, we use other squid as an example for perhaps this squid could be following a similar pattern, is a big one is a lot of the squid are very um, susceptible to environmental changes. So the pH, for example, acidification, um, the squid, are like humble or the jumbo squid, they're known that when the acidic changes even just a little bit, and you're looking at like 0.05% uh, units, that squid loses about 30% of its eating habits and its activity level drops by about 45%. So if you're looking, if you're a squid, like the Humboldt squid, you eat a, a copious amount of food, your activity level drops, but you're eating, you're still eating a your, your excuse me, your uh, eating rate does not decrease as much as your activity rate, so you're still burning quite a, a lot of energy. So that means if you're not moving and you're not using as much energy, but you still are consuming as much energy, you have to find a different way to go about it than you have previously. So the amount, for example, of zooplankton you're going to need to eat to uh, actively eat that is going to be a lot harder than if, let's say, you found herring, which are calorically dense, nutritionally dense, and are a lot easier to eat. You only need to eat one versus the amount of zooplankton to be full of herring. <laughs> You can imagine that's quite a lot. <coughs> so that's a, a really, we don't know if arm hook squid, excuse me, uh, especially the Magister and the Boreal Pacific are susceptible to those pH changes, but this dietary changes and uh, the way they're moving to inner, more stable waters is really indicative that perhaps that environment change in the open ocean is really affecting them more than, than we had previously thought, and that's something worth looking into. And that's what my research really started to develop on was, wait a second, 
maybe we think the armhook squid are as susceptible as other squid like the jumbo or the squid I study in my PhD, uh, which are the common, the Japanese common squid, they're also very susceptible to pH change. So then another, another theory which I haven't looked into as much and haven't researched as much because we don't know too much about the life cycle of the magister uh, squid or the Boreal Pacific is does their diet alter as they get older? But mostly, the people who have been reporting, and the reports have been larger, more adult squid. And do those adult squid eat different things, perhaps, than the juveniles? For example, out in the ocean, there's a lot more juveniles. We haven't been seeing those reports in inside waters, perhaps. It is migratory with life cycle, and they eat different food when they're older. That could be a distinct possibility, but then we haven't really found them before now. So that's really what we're looking at is when was the first time that these guys were really seen? And, and the theory that we're really working with now, or that I'm really working with, is that it is that their diet has changed. We don't have the information, for example, from Frederick Sound and right outside, you know, in the Horn Cliffs, what they're eating there. We don't know. We haven't, we haven't looked in their stomach there, and it would be really great to be able to do that. <laughs> I would really love to know. I'm sure everyone else would too. But so now, now we know, okay, they were out there, and now they've, they've moved in, that's good, that's great, but what does that mean? We have a theory as to why, you know, they've moved and they've changed their prey for potential many reasons, but what does that implicate in terms of a food web or a bigger picture if I step back and say, okay, now I have a potentially invasive species, like what if this were the Humboldt, we would treat it as an invasive species. Should we be treating the armhook squid the same way as we treat the humble squid as a very invasive and very uh, uh, dangerous species, if you will? So what we look at then is what are the habits of the armhook, what are their prey, and what are their predators, what's eating them? So the prey we already kind of talked about, right? Um, the 20% of the diet is made up of that, that salmon, the herring, halibut, and the sablefish as they move inside. That, for us, and for those as a community, that's a, those are pretty big fisheries in this area. And now you have a, a predator to those moving in, and not in small quantities, right? More and more are being reported. And squid are schooling animals. So not just one or two, but they come in schools of hundreds of tons, potentially. And so that could be um, an implication to look at and say, wait a second, now something's coming in that's 20% of their diet is going to be eating what we're fishing. Or, we look at the other way, not the human aspect, but they also still, 50 to 60% of their diet is consisted of krill and zooplankton. And what also eats those things? Or are there going to be competition? Because what also eats those things? Humpback, whales, seabirds, migratory seabirds, juvenile fish, and now you have another, another animal, a large biomass of an animal, coming in and also eating those foods. So is there enough in this area to sustain all life? Uh, or is something going to have to give and take if someone's going to move out or someone's going to move in? And then you, you can look at the opposite side. Okay, all these guys have come in. They're here and oh, we have to admit that. What eats them? We know sperm whales eat them, you know, killer whales and dolls porpoises. They're already here. When they're offshore, they do eat and we do find the remains of the Magister and the Boreal Pacific in their uh, stomachs. So we say, okay, they eat them offshore, but now that they're in these waters, would it be safe to assume that if they're in a nice group at around 100 meters, that's a nice, easy meal for a sperm whale. They don't have to go down to you know, 1,000 meters to get their food. They have a nice squid source that's not so deep. And it's a nice big squid, right? About 33 inches, it pops out at both of them. And so you say, OK, that, that's, that's something to look into. Maybe these animals are going to start changing their diet now in inside waters, and now that the prey that they have found outside is now inside. And then also, animals that, for example, the Barents Beaks will, their primary diet is the Boreo Pacific and the Magister squid. They are only really found in those outside waters in the Gulf. But now that those, those animals, that, and including the false killer and the pilot will, they might move in as the squid, they're, those are the primary food sources for, that, for those animals, move into Chad and move into Frederickstown, also down in Ketchikan, there have been a lot of reports down there as well. And so, but what does that mean for animals that don't previously come into these waters, but now their food's coming in here? And then also, in a less food web related and more, you know, fishing community and Southeast Alaska <laughs> related, you also say oh, there's a potential for uh, squid fishery. 
right? It is a squid that's used in fishery. It's not just a bycatch, though it is an often pollock bycatch. But it is used as a, a bait and, a, and an edible when they're when they're small or an edible fishery. There's a fishery existing in, in uh, the Aleutian. And we have to stop and realize that squid fisheries are actually the largest fishery in the world. A lot of people think, oh, it's going to be crab or salmon or some form of crustacean. No, squid tops that by an alarming percentage. And there's not a lot of management for it, and it's a lot of free for all. Squid happen to have shorter lifespans, and they give birth to a lot of babies. <laughs> and some of them, more than once, some spawn and die like the arm hook squid, but some give birth you know, every year for three or four years, and then they die. So you have what seems to be a pretty pretty sustainable population, or at least a large population, and you get, you have actually have fisheries who have them in Antarctica, you have them in Africa, Australia, South America, Europe, Asia, of course, and even in other parts of Alaska. So why wouldn't you start looking at one and say, wait a second, if they're here, what could be utilized here to do that same fishery that's up in the Aleutians when we have the same species in what seems to be the same population? So to look at the fisheries management and kind of delve into that, since that's something that really seems to interest a lot of the, the local communities, is that you can see the list on the uh, southeast side is very <coughs> short versus the list on the Ocean's Island Management Area. And so pre-2005, so let me go back a little bit, the fishery for arm hook squid in particular, the Boreal Pacific and Magister. More the Boreal Pacific is a little smaller. They taste, I think, better than, uh, I haven't tasted that one, so I can't say, but uh, it started in 78, and it went to about 1995 before there was a limit. And in 1995, a limit was initiated that said, okay, the average catch from, since this fishery has been open until 95 will be used as a cap, as a quota for, for at least next year. And they kept that cap. They didn't do much research on it. They didn't produce any papers. And no one I know of can find any papers saying, oh, you know, this is why we're keeping it this way. They just did. And it wasn't until 2015 um, in the East Bering Sea when they did some trawling surveys and uh, some slope surveys that indicated, oh, there's a lot more than we thought of these Magister squid in this Boreal Pacific space. Quite a few. Enough that we're going to say, okay, from we're going to test this out from 2015 to 2018. We're going to increase. Uh, the quota by 0.75% every year. So for 2015, your 2014 quota will be increased by 0.75%, and 2016, your 2015 quota will be increased, and so on and so forth until 2018. Now it's on the drawing board again, however, because in 2015 and 2016, they closed both fisheries about a month earlier than anticipated because the quota was met. And they left it at that and said, we, we met the quota, and we're going to close it a month early and both in 2015 and 2016. So now they're looking at, okay, let's do some more trawling surveys. And those are on the table and they're being publicized to indicate, oh, there are even more than when we checked in 2015. Even though we're fishing, they haven't actually decreased or stabilized. The, the population is continuing to increase. The bigger question is uh, finding their population. So if you're going to make a fishery out of it, you know, you have a pest fishery that happened in 2011 out of Ketchikan, and 10 tons were caught, about 4,000 individuals uh, rounded up. And that's all I can find. <laughs> that's all anyone that I know knows of, and that was it. It was a test fishery, and then nothing happened of it. Whereas the illusions tested, found more, and kept going. So to incentivize a fishery, you're going to have to find a population. Right? We're going to have to map out other than, oh, you know, you show me a picture and that's, you told me that's where it is and I, that, I agree that is indeed a magister squid right out of Petersburg and that's in 2014 in June. All right. You know, other than that, you know, how can we find out where they are? And to do so, you can do acoustic assessments using echo sounders. Some of you, I'm sure, are really familiar with those. And, and those are very effective as long as it's not shallow or the terrain is not um, the benthic terrain, the bottom terrain is not alternating a bunch. Then it doesn't become as reliable of a source. Then there's also trawling surveys which are used a lot in the evolutions to, for uh, management of not just the boreo and the magister armor squid, but armor squid and squid in general. And then also 
sonar could be utilized in the future and because there's a lot of talk of, okay, signal patterns are really great. For example, you can tell cotton mackerel and St. Lawrence area, they discovered cotton mackerel on the sonar, they have different signal patterns that are very identifiable. Initially, they look the same. And how can we tell the cotton and mackerel population? And all of a sudden, they started having um, people analyze it, and it actually acted differently. And so if you could do that for a student, not just arm hook in general, but specifically honing in on the ones you're trying to fish, for example, the Boreo or the Magister, then you could say, okay, you can get a live time. I mean, this is what, as of today, this is how many are down there approximately, and this is what they're doing, this is where they are. But you also get a much larger scale. You can do a bigger sweep than if you're just doing a trawling survey. Right? That's to a very specific area. And who knows about the other side, and that's going to take time, and that's not going to be as fast as a result, whereas if you can just sweep with that sonar. But no one's actually classified that information yet. <laughs> so it's something that someone actually has to say, OK, it's worth investing time and, and research into looking at what they look like on a sonar. Right now, no one really knows. They look like blobs, potentially. As when I look in Japan and I see them on a sonar, they look like a blob, and it doesn't look much different than a group of fish. So I would not be the person that they would be hiring to find out what it looks like on a sonar pattern. But hopefully, someone will, because that's actually really, really interesting information that could be passed on. So then not just that one person knows, but all the fishermen that are out there suddenly have the ability to look and go, hey, wait a second, that's a group of magisters who live right there. And they weren't here last week. So that brings me to identifying them. Right? You now, you can say, okay, potentially we could see them on a sonar. That would be really great. We could trawl them, we'll pull them up. If we jig, we can pull them up. But how do I know I'm looking at an arm hook squid? How do I know it's not another squid that just came up here now? It's joining the other two that are already in here. And it's a new one, right? That's a very potential possibility. Everyone's been commenting to me in this group, oh, things have been really crazy. There's just new stuff popping up. How do we know it's not another new one? <laughs> and not the match for the Boreal Pacific. And so for identifiable features of the squid, so the squid, as you guys know, it has a fin, right? It's a cylindrical body with arms coming out, has eight arms, two tentacles, and a fin on the back side. The, the really identifiable features for it, uh, for the arm hook in particular, is not looking at is there a club on the two tentacles, because that's present in some and not present in other arm hooks, way, but actually looking at the arms themselves, but anywhere from four to all eight of those arms are going to have hooks on them. Some of you, have, I asked you, well, did you get hooks when you pulled it in? Did you miss the hooks? Or did it, did it grab you a little bit? Because all of a sudden you pull the squid and you're like, oh, this isn't as harmless as I initially thought it was, because that's actually quite, quite grabbing on my skin. And having, having been poked by them and been bitten by squid, I can tell you it's not the most fun thing in the world. And so that's something to also be aware of if you're jigging, when you jig for them or when you're, when you're pulling them up and go, oh, maybe I should be a little bit wary and look for them first before I grab. But that's a key indicator of an arm hook squid from any of the other squid, is they have to have on at least, at least two, but average four of their arms, they have those hooks on there. Um, for grabbing prey, small fishes, that kind of thing. And in addition to that, you can say, okay, well that's great. That still leaves me 13 different species to choose from of the arm hook squid. How am I going about that? <laughs> and especially since the one in the book that, you know, if you get a book and it's a nice picture where the squid's all laid out, it's been preserved perfectly, somehow not been broken at all. <laughs> and that's not always how they come off on your fishing boat. So, and what you can look at is the picture on the right here is actually a really great indicator because it shows scarring. These are mostly red to dark purple squid. They scar white. Or if they're not kept cold, these two specifically become very white. So if they're not kept at a, a good cold temperature for long enough, uh, or before or after they die, then they're gonna they're gonna turn white. That's a big indicator that you you've got it yourself a boreo or a magister squid. But then also you can look at the size. It's a big squid. It's about 33 inches on average for the magister squid. And the magister squid versus the Boreal Pacific is where we really want to get into since both of those are the ones we're finding out here and how do you know which one you're eating today. So the one right there, that's the Boreal Pacific squid. You can tell all the arms are the same length. 
That's a really great indicator. You have no tentacles that are longer than the arm, and you definitely don't have any clubs. So what I mean by clubs, pretty explanatory. You can see on that one, there's two tentacles that are longer than the rest of the arms, and on the end is a club-like feature that has suckers on it. There are arm hooks squid with clubs that are red and they have a nice big body and are about 33 inches. So to identify the magister from all the rest of those that match that description, you if you see the picture on the left, or the, you can't, it's hard to, it's a little blurry on the screen in particular, but they're all very tiny rows of suckers. There is some that have suckers and hooks, some that just have hooks, some that have big suckers. The ones you guys are pulling up should have rows of tiny suckers. If they don't, you're looking at a different, uh, potentially one we didn't know was around here, a different type of, of uh, arm hook squid. But the magister, they have that nice red body and they have those tiny suckers on the tentacle and the clubs on the end. And so that's really the key indicators, as well as they're active during the day and the night. Previous to this retreat, I hadn't really realized that they referencing the magister, not the borough Pacific at this point. The magister squid, if you jig for it or fish for it during the day, you are like just as likely to pull it up as you are at night. Normally, these squid are uh, more night, uh, uh, night active. And a, for whatever reason, in the inside water specifically, these uh, magister squid are being caught during the daytime. A lot of the catch reports that we're getting are actually daytime. Active fishing is, is in the daytime, including out of catch cans and sport fishermen have started doing this, and they're they're jigging them in the day. And then we also so those to go back to this. Those are all part of this page. These are all nice again, like book pictures. <laughs> they're not really great in the field. And so some people in the community have been so kind to donate pictures to me. And so you can see this is what they look like in the field, which is a little bit different and a little more real life. Right? You don't always have time to stand there and look, oh, this has tiny little suckers on this technical club. So you can see it's really red. It truly is. When you first pull it out of the water, it's going to be that bright red, that dark bright red. And then also, it's thin. You can see in the middle picture, it's really large. It takes up over a third of the body. The reason why fins are larger and smaller on squid, we don't know. But on the arm hook squid, they have a really distinct shape. But the magister and the Royal Pacific squid have the largest of the fins of all of the magisters. So you're getting like a third of that size. So of the body size. So that's also really nice. And then you can also see that I believe someone was just using a salmon lure and they managed to hook a squid. So I put I put on the left side the mark and opalescent squid just to Put in your mind that there are other squid besides our folk squid in inside waters that are already here. So when I was thinking about this, it's really referencing the, the arm hooks that are new to these waters, because you can stick a cave, you can go off the dock, and you can get yourself a market or an opalescent squid. The opalescent squid gets about twice as big, the lower picture, as what as indicated. But they're much more what we consider normal squid. They're a little opaque. They have some dotting and modeling on them. And other arms are, are all pretty even with their tentacle length. So and that kind of gives you an, an ability to, not only when you're having fun, but also if you identify and say, wait a second, I know what's in my, it's in my water. And I know potentially why they're here, why they've moved in here, and what that could possibly mean in the future. And again, it's, it's, it's the groundwork, it's the basic research that hasn't been done before. So we don't have a lot of anything, really anything to go off of. So it's really, not only is it important information, but it's information that leads us in a direction for future research, for someone who doesn't already have the existing thesis to come along and go, wait a second, this, this could substantiate to something really big and something really important. And we need as much information as we can to proceed with that. So that's kind of the, the end, and I have quite a few references which I've used, <laughs> which will be available online, I'm told, if you would like to look at any of those. And then I do want to thank uh, quite a few people, but Sunny, Kelly, the public library, my captain for dealing with me, <laughs> and um, anyone else who's donated their time and, and 
taken pictures and wants to sell me samples and all that. It's really great information to have and, and that's how a lot of squid research and cephalopod research starts. There's a lot less public interest in squid than there are in, let's say, whales. Whales are considered a lot cuter, a lot more friendly and fun. They do things like, you know, reach. Squid do not. <laughs> so they're a little less exciting to see out in the wild, right? But they're nonetheless being a basis in the food web. It's not only they're eating a basis in the food web, but they are a basis for a lot of other mammals in the food web. So they are an important part of, of a, a bigger ecosystem that we don't always take the time to look at. So thank you for coming. So I would love to open the door for questions, providing they're not um, in the, uh, I started working with squid in the uh, early 1980s here, uh, much earlier, further north on the coast of Kibbelina Point Hope. Okay. Um, I thought I'd just mention uh, yeah. several, several things here. We started working with oligoopalescence off of Ketchikan, off of the west coast of Prince of Wales Island, and did test fisheries there, uh, did, a, did a large fishery, yeah. some 50, 60 tons that we called it, and then test marketed them in. Um, in Narita, Japan, and they were transshipped to Shanghai just to see the marketability. They were highly marketable. Uh, this is also known as the California market squid. Yes. <clears throat> and the. Um, I had a picture of that one in the last slide. The, the tentacles were found to be larger, thicker, and sweeter than their counterparts in the the, uh, the California coastal fishery. Oh. Um, and that's, so there's another story there. So you're, you mentioned, you know, there is room for, for a, a fishery. Yes, there, there probably is. However, it should point out there was nervousness on the part of fishermen <coughs> about the continuation of that uh, 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 squid being such an important uh, forage species to a, to a whole host of other. Um, now, we get into this other question. We used to call these guys the Japanese nail squid, and many older gill netters and trollers, I don't know if we have very many of them in the room, will be very familiar with that. Um, in, the, in the 80s, we started to see um, a, large, a large percentage of fish, king salmon primarily in the troll fishery, that have these diagonal slashes down their sides. And it was wondering, we, we thought maybe at first it was an offshore, uh, you know, squid gillnet fishery that was snagging these and causing these unusual, but no, no, it was actually uh, ascertained that it was the, the Japanese nail squid. Now, are you familiar with this in the older literature? No, I'm not familiar with that common yeah, name. If you perhaps it, give me it. It's yeah. probably bar it's, it's burial toothless. Okay. Yeah, so we finally we find and on. and you'll notice uh, you'll notice that some of the older charts. I was yeah. gifted a, a chart of Central Southeast Alaska that was printed in in 19 uh, 19 aught something or other. I think it was around 1920. And you'll notice there on the central part to the, of the uh, of Frederick Sound, it was it, a big big lettering squid shoals. And, it, and to, to make ter a terrible long story short, um, uh, I received a lot of anecdotal evidence of tremendous concentrations of squid in that area. And so we went out, you know, on a, on a low fishing boat and, and attempted to squid jig using quite large uh, jigs. But the squid there and the, the weather was, was really poor. Fishing at night, very shallow. And we, we did catch a couple of the so-called Japanese nail squid, uh, quite large, sa same sorts of, of squid that you're looking yeah, at there. And, and, they were the, and we used the, the traditional Japanese method, uh, uh, lights hanging over the side mm -hmm. and so on. And there were large concentrations of squid in that area at night when you properly shine them up. Yeah. So I, I thought I'd just kind of bring this to your attention that I yeah. think these squid have been here for a great long time. And, we're, 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 and that, is a, that is a good point. That is something that we don't have the data for. We don't have a large amount of data for that that is accessible at a university level for me. Yeah. And, and that's the biggest problem I, in that research. I, right? I, and and is, it, is it just that squid or did that also mean that there were magister squid as well? Yeah. You'd have to be a real bibliography freak 
in order to, to pull out a lot, but it is there. Yeah. I, and in our files here, the Marine Advisory Program files, uh, there is a lot of this more ancient literature that is, is very, very interesting. So anyway, that, that takes care of it. It'd Thank you. It would be interesting to know if in that really old literature, being able to, to spend the time looking through that, which is why it's a whole thesis project in and of itself, to see if there are magisters referenced in that or not. So far, I've found no, but again, I have not been able to delve into it. This is in the gray literature. And it, <laughs> it, it's it's going to be really hard, but it, I think as, when you, if you're going to stick with this, you really got to get back in, into this this great literature and also get as much of the anecdotal stuff from the yeah. these older guys around, especially the guild editors, especially the trollers. They have a lot of interesting stories for you. Oh, definitely. I found quite a few trollers with interesting stories, not from a long time ago, too. So yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah. And if you have any other questions or comments in the in the group, it's very tricky. Well, to, to go and catch them and do some sampling, uh -huh. you shine lights, and I've had two before them down in uh, BC, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, kind of on, on the beach when they're yeah. like spawning. Um, but I, I guess there's like egg casings down in the Narrows. For the Magister? Well, I don't know. I just, I, I heard about this. <laughs> yeah. like, when they, the, um, the market and the whole lesson like both have egg casings in the Narrows. I know uh, that already. They, those egg casings are actually really neat. So one to spawn once and die again, and that's about 200. And that one little egg casing has about 200 to 300 of those squid. So it's quite a prolific squid. Um, all, all, all of them. Um, one of the things that, um, when these things first were noticed here in town, I, I was working at Fishing Game and started to call and, like, where it's kind of coming called folks that know of down in Seattle and they were at that time like you said they just thought they were offshore and I was like no, no they're squid here but I one of the things that I also was asking with some of the older fishermen around town um, some of the older fishermen biologists that they yeah. had run into them and they're um, actually I believe Dennis Squirrel has one of his poetry books um, one of his books, and there's a picture of a farm book squid oh. um, between two slices of bread. Some, you know, something <laughs> humorous thing that Dennis said. And I remember talking with him, um, and it was something that they did turn up. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a picture that he took when he was beam trawling for shrimp. You know, that was, that was his fishery. So there, there, there seemed to be some indications from some of the folks here yeah. that they had seen, you know, because show them a picture of what these, like picture I showed you. Yeah. And they said, yeah, we've seen these before, but it didn't sound like they were prolific. Yes. But whether, um, and like catching them, in, I don't think they would catch them a lot in a lot of shrimp fishing here, mm -hmm. but there was an indication that I had ever heard from these, from these guys that they ever caught a lot of them. And I don't, you know, there's still guys that are shrimp strong, but, and I don't think that they tend to pick them up. Um, yeah, it's a, it's you know, a, that are in the same area where guys here have gone out and picked them up. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of, of groundwork for that, and then it does bring up interesting and really important points too. It could be migratory as well, you know, with the life cycle, since you guys are finding really big ones, those are the full side adults. <laughs> That you're, that you're finding. Right, but there were other ones that were smaller, mm -hmm. and that was the maximum size. Oh, okay. Um, that, that 31 or so inches. Yeah, that was, you know. But you could do it in another How many, I mean, there were some that were, yeah, you know, size. Yeah, a little bit bigger than that, yeah. you know. But there's quite a few anecdotal reports around the area of much larger squid <laughs> than what we've been catching. Mm -hmm. Uh, the mammals a meter or more long, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. approaching two meters in some cases. Yes. And, and there's been enough of these reports that there's got to be something to it. You know, a lot of different fishermen have seen them, caught the gill nets, caught on a crab pot, washed up on the beach. Those, those wouldn't be in, um, the arm, in the arm hook family so much, is my guess, because 35 inches tends to be the higher size for some of those arm 
we've had them brought in to fish and game that they were seven feet long. Those, those to me long. sound more. There are more, more uh, in the family of the jumbo squid. The club, club one. Yeah. yeah. Versus the arm, the arm hook. Just a bit different. Which are found all the way. Some of those reports also go down to California too. So it's really interesting to start digging through right. because it's. If you don't know the different types of squid, it's really hard to tell the differences. Right? They could be, oh, this one has a fin that's a third of the body versus a half of the body length. And that could be the real big identifying feature. Uh, some people will be curious about whether some of these larger squid are edible. And, and we get into the, the problem of ammoniation in squid meat, that some squid, especially the larger squid, in part of their physiological process, part of their flotation, process will use uh, ammonia, uh, ammonia-like compounds and renders them somewhat <laughs> inedible, unfortunately. Uh, the the magister in the Boreal Pacific don't have that at the event. No, they're, they're so very tasty. They're very, they're, they pretty <laughs> much taste like squid, and if you cook them really well, they taste like really good batter, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just a quick question, what is the uh, primary method for the fisheries for these? Uh, for uh, the up in the, in the Aleutians, it's yeah. mostly a, a trawl. It a is trawl. a fishery. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in the test fishery in Ketchikan, it's mostly a jig fishery. Right. And just use, utilizing some Japanese methods, lights and, and jigging that way. Right. Again, what was that method? Sorry, the, uh, the, the off the Aleutians, they mostly trawl. Yeah, but the Ketchikan? Ketchikan was a jig okay. with, of using a Japanese ah, method good, with the good. lights. And our, our method was Lumpara net. It, it was a Portuguese, very successful use of a Portuguese adapt, adaptation. Um, and so it's good to hear that, that you use the, the jigging machine. Yeah. Ryan, was it, was it like a herring saint tried in, in it, that test machine? It, it was, it's usually used in two vessels. If you can just imagine a clam shell. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, what we did was we only used one vessel, big buoy put off here, and you just simply drop it off, go and pick up your buoy, and you bring it together, and they close out underneath each other. It's it's a very primitive saying that, but it worked beautifully. But in Japan, you, I do use some, some similar methods with quite a few saying variations, and Japan used it as yeah. well. It, the, the, the problem here is, especially off the, the coast of Prince of Wales Island, is you get into real shallow waters. Uh, sometimes you know a couple hundred feet or less, and and you uh, so regular sains you get into trouble with. Yeah. So anyway, anyway, there right. we go. If, if the group is not have too many more questions, I can maybe disperse and enjoy anything in the back with some waters and brownies and stuff if you'd like. If you have any more questions for me, or you can pull me aside. I'll be around right here, so I'm not going anywhere. I was just curious about looking at the you know, predator and prey relationship mm -hmm. and um, the fact that sperm whales started to show up in mm -hmm. Chatham Straits about yes. many years ago. People thought they were probably the black cut fishermen in because that's what the province got in the black cut ones. But I don't know, maybe was there any evidence that that squid was increasing in population at that time when they had to dry us to the sperm whales? The earliest, the earliest we Recorded or perhaps surveyed actual studies of is unfortunately not until 2011, 2009 to 2011. The early studies for these flew were up because, like, you just already all know, and they said, No, they're in the open ocean, that's where we're focusing, they're in the open ocean. It wasn't until that 09 and 11 years for the, the magisters that they were really starting to look on coastal waters. Uh, just one last point, too those who follow the really, really, really ancient literature will find that in Chatham Strait, the possible reason why there was a, a, a whale industry there, why there were so many whales in there of, of a number of varieties, was some sort of a magical interaction between herring and squid. Uh, tremendous, it, it, you, when you read the old notes, and they, they talk about the, the, the herring shoals of just incredible numbers. And then uh, in various other areas, the squid shoals, all side by side. So, but that's over 100 years ago. It'd be interesting to delve into that at some point. But 
Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate the great turnout. Hopefully you walk away with something. And if you have any questions or want to know more, let me know and I'm happy to uh, stick around. Thank you, Stephanie.